Eve Hogan, and for my latest documentary, I interviewed Captain De Crepini. He was the pilot who saved the A380 that had an engine failure after taking off from Singapore. Here is this interview in full. Good morning, Captain De Crepini. Hello, Eve. Thank you for having me in your lovely house, and thank you for your time. Oh, pleasure. Pleasure. I have just recently read your book, and I enjoyed it. But my thought was, why did you pick the title? Out of all the titles that could have described this extraordinary event, why QF32? Well, because it's a very short title. We'd had other titles we thought of, like Broken Wing, but that wasn't very acceptable with other things that have been happening in the airlines industry. So we changed that name. We thought we needed a smaller, a shorter title. And so we brainstormed it. There was about six people. We came up with all these different titles, Crisis in the Air, Crisis over Singapore, Emergency in the Air. And we decided just to keep the working, the title that everyone actually referred to it. They said, what about the QF32 flight? And so it was a flight number. And we thought, everyone's using that. Let's use that. Now, we clearly needed to get permission to do it. But I think it's a very short title. It fits in very small letters on a, on a big book. And uh, we're very happy with that. And it surprised us in retrospect we didn't use the, the shorter title earlier. David Warren, the inventor of the black box. Mm -hmm. What do you think about his contributions to your industry? Well, the black box has changed aviation because you can have an accident and you can find the, the rubble on the ground or remnants of a car accident. And if you don't know what's happened, then, then you really can't determine how you're going to recover from the incident, discover what went wrong and work out what to do as a consequence to stop the incident happening again. So the black box that David Warren invented on the aircraft like a 330, that stores 3,000 parameters. On a, on a A380, it stores 30,000 30, parameters. So when we have an incident, we can go back through the black box and we can find out exactly what happened, which includes a voice recorder. So we know what the pilots are saying. We know what the, the aircraft is doing performance-wise and what the instruments are saying. And that we can do a forensic analysis on that and work out how the aircraft crashed, work out what, why it crashed, and prevent future crashes. Sadly, he's died and he didn't really get the credit he deserved. But what part of the book do you think he liked the most? What part of the book? David Warren would love the fact that we've been so forensic in the analysis of the data. There's so much information coming out in the book. He would, most people are thinking, where did you get all this information from? How did you remember the time scale? How do you remember what happened? All the checklists, all the things that we did. And that's because of all these recorders. There's probably about a thousand computers in an A380 and all these different systems are all recording, they're storing, they're transmitting information to Toulouse in France, to Derby in London and also to Qantas in Sydney. There's information going everywhere. After the incident, they discovered that there was so much information being stored and transmitted around the world, we could rebuild the full details of the flight like no other flight before. So David Warren, was the person who started that whole technology. He should be very proud of himself. I think he'd like the page 332 where you talk about the black box and the investigators asking you um, about the conversation going on in the cockpit while you're flying. And you ask, why don't you listen to the voice recorder? And they say, well, that over overread itself because of the fact that it was kept on recording until the engine turned off. You've had some time to reflect on that. What do you think about that? Well, you've, you're very impressed that you've picked up on that in the book. You see, even though it's 50 years after he invented the black box, we're still discovering things. And the logic for the black box was, we start the recording while we're doing the pre-flight of the aeroplane, before we even, an hour before we start the engines. And then the black box will record in a, and it has to be legally a, a 30 minute loop but the Airbus said, we'll go more than that, we'll go two hours. So they voluntarily made their recorder, which is five channels, four channels in the cockpit and a channel in the cabin. They record five channels continuously in a two hour loop. And that was thought to be absolutely fantastic. But the two hour loop stops, it stops recording when the last engine shuts down. Now remember engine number two failed in flight. Engine number one, had all kinds of damage to it. We couldn't shut it down on the ground. Engine number one didn't shut down until three hours and 39 minutes after we landed. And so because that was still running, the two hour, this, the three hours and 39 while this engine was running after we'd stopped, the voice recorder's running and it, wrote, it over wrote, over recorded 
just about all of the flight, which was very sad. So they're going to have to rethink the logic of how they keep a flight recorder going. The only good news is, which is not in the book because I didn't have time, there was so much damage to the airplane, the flight data recorder was only working for 50% of the time. It was so badly damaged. So we have, instead of being two hours, it's actually recording bits and pieces over a four hour period. So we actually have the recording for the last 10 minutes of our flight, which is very good. But there's big gaps because the, in, the electrical system was being um, degraded and, and intermittent. So uh, it's very sad that the voice recorder wasn't there to give insight into all the decisions we're making and how we're doing it and the management, management structure. But we were able to reconstitute it anyway. Rolls-Royce was the maker of the faulty engine, did they? Um, what was the repercussion for them? It cost them a lot of money. They had, there was an oil leak inside the engine that caused the engine to fail. It's the first time this engine's failed in 40 years with this type of failure. So first time ever, ever in 40 years. So it was bad luck, but they had to fix this engine. That engine cost $18 million. This engine had $14 million worth of damage to it. The aircraft had at least $135 million worth of damage. They had to replace just about all the Rolls-Royce engines around the world and move things around. And then they had to fix the other engines. It cost Rolls-Royce hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. That's the repercussion for them. But they, had a f they have an order book. If, if the people have ordered engines from Rolls-Royce, that the orders that they have not fulfilled cost is, adds up to $100 billion. So, f so $500 million, which maybe it's costing perhaps, is, is not that much. When you're the, during the flight the engine exploded, the case around it was supposed to keep it from damaging any of the other parts of the plane. In this instance, it didn't. Did this upset you at all or confuse you? Well, now, now, now that's actually an incorrect statement. The engine's designed to stop a blade at the front coming out of the engine. That's contained, because those blades are hollow. They're like straws that are, that are shaped into a fan blade. And so they can be contained, they're nice and light. The turbine disc, which is at the back of the engine, weighs 160 kilograms, spins at 10,000 RPM, high tensile steel. Nothing will stop that. It's not designed to stop it. They can't stop it. If they, to stop that, you'd have to build a concrete block around the engine, and then the aircraft would be so heavy it'd never take off. So they, don't, they, they accept that sometimes this will break. Now, this is the first time in 40 years this is broken. Most of the time when these turbines break, the aircraft doesn't come home. But they design the aircraft with special leading edges here. They design them with backup wiring limbs going down the back of the wing. They design them with all kinds of defences so when the turbine disc does break, the aircraft should not crash. Now, it's designed to take one piece. So the manufacturers are told, design it so you can take any one piece of this turbine disc and make sure the aircraft survives. We had three pieces and that challenged us. That's the reason we had so many so much damage. When you're writing this book, did Qantas let you write anything you want? Well, they let me write it. They, because it's got a Qantas, I'm wearing a Qantas hat and there's a Qantas aircraft and there's a Qantas call sign, a f the flight number, they, they had the right to edit the book. And I would never write a book anyway that criticised Qantas because I'm very proud of Qantas and I think they've done a great job. And the pilots and the crew did a great job. I'm proud of Qantas and I'm proud of the, the, the job that everyone did on board. So my story would always be a good story. And Qantas actually changed very little of the book. Very, very little. Um, they were happy with the book and I'm very happy with the book. What did they change? They took out a, about three sentences that just they thought, I can't, they said, uh, can you confirm that these words were said? And I said, I can't. I think they were, but I can't confirm it. They said, well, if you can't confirm it, let's just make it simple and take it out. It didn't really change anything. It was trivial. But it's probably more legalistic and uh, not damaging anyone, but they, they were just being very careful, and that's okay. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you for the interview. Could you please sign my book? Eve, of course, I'd love to. I'm very honoured to sign your book. To Eve. Thank you for reading my book. I hope to see you in an A380, in my A380, soon. Best regards, Richard D. Crepin. And it's... Since I released my last video on David Warren's Black Box, the response has been overwhelming. 
I asked for an airport to be named after David Warren, as other countries have done when they named airports after other great people. Like the Tesla Airport in Serbia, the John Leonard Airport in Liverpool, England, and the Marco Polo Airport in Venice, Italy. This story was on the front page of news.com.au and many other newspapers. I've been interviewed on many radio stations around Australia, such as one in Sydney, one in Brisbane, and one in Canberra. All of this helped to get 2,000 signatures on change.org and with so many beautiful comments like this one. I remain the only living person with major involvement in that development with David Warren. Dr. Warren was a brilliant and articulate combustion scientist who was well capable of thinking outside his immediate field and had incredible perseverance in spite of being surrounded by non-believers. We are getting closer to having an airport named after David Warren. I know that naming an airport isn't a small thing but I want every time a politician gets off at the Canberra airport that they are reminded that Australia is a country of innovation and great inventions because the kids of today will be making the discoveries of tomorrow. Josh Fox summed up my thoughts perfectly with his comment on my petition. Because we should remember and praise our scientists and inventors at least as much as our sports heroes and politicians. So let the government and the owners know, if you have not signed my petition or know someone who benefits from David Warren's invention, urge them to sign too. My name is Eve Kogan and together we can achieve.